Hello, we're going to make a change in our talking for a little bit. This is the 1st of December, 2023. We're going to talk about, tell me the story of Jesus. We want to focus in on the coming of that child who is our Savior. And uh, I want to try and get us to look from a little different direction at the coming of the Lord Jesus. I want to start from the top and work our way down rather than starting in the in the manger and working our way up. So let's pray and then I'll tell you what we have in mind. Dear Lord, we thank you for this season of time. We thank you that there's a time set aside in which we think on and remember that the Lord Jesus came as a real little baby boy, born and grew up and became the the one who died for us, the gift of God which is eternal life. Thank you. Help us to uh, appreciate the gift. Help us to see perhaps some things we may not have thought about him before, or at least to see an arrangement in which we connect him to the whole of the story. Guide and keep us as we study. Be the teacher and Lord of our time here, Holy Spirit, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. As we head into this time of of year, um, as we were thinking about Jesus and his, his coming, well, what do we know about that little baby boy? If you've been at this for very long, you've had Christmas messages preached to you again and again and again. I want to start in Hebrews chapter 1. If you'll turn to Hebrews 1, we'll read verses 1 through 4, and that's going to be our launching place and from which we will consider the story of Jesus. Listen to what it says. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, the ancestors, in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he, that's talking about Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Now, This is an introduction in which the writer of Hebrews is going to go in and talk about the place of angels in the hierarchy of of spiritual beings. But he's setting up the fact that it's God's son, Jesus, that is higher than the angels, that is God's word to us. God spoke to us through his son. Here's how God sent his message in times past. It says he spoke through prophets in many portions and many ways, many portions of scripture and in many ways that they uh, gave his word. Different prophets had different parts of the whole message that they delivered. And to see how God spoke through people, through prophets at times, uh, look at Second Chronicles. And we're going to look at Second Chronicles 20. And it tells a, it tells a, a particular incident that happened. Second Chronicles 20, and we're going to look through verses 1 through 19. So the first four verses tell us what's going on. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon together with some of the Meonites came to make war against Jehoshaphat. He's the king of, of Israel. And then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of Aram. And behold, there there in Hazazon Tamar, that is in Gedi. Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord, and they even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. And so as they came together, Jehoshaphat stood up to lead this assembly in seeking the Lord. And in verse 6, he starts praying, O Lord our God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? This was a Hebrew way to say, you are the Lord in the heavens. You are the king over all the kingdoms on earth. 
power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. And he, he, he reminds God of what he's done in the past. He reminds God we understand who you are. And, he, and, and as he's presenting his needs to the Lord, he presents and says, here's our problem. He said in verse 9, he said, you promised if Ephos should come on us, that we should stand before your house, before the temple, and we should, we should call out to you. And he says, verse 10, now here's the problem. The sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you didn't let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, we turned aside from them and didn't destroy them. See how they're rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. You hear what it said? These were these Arab type, these Arab uh, Middle Easterners were going to try to drive Israel out of the land that God had given them. That sounds like you're reading the papers today with the war that's going on in Israel. And he says, Lord, will you not judge them? We're powerless against this great multitude. Will you come and help us? He asked. And he lays it out before God. And in the middle of the assembly, in verse 14, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, son of Mattathiah, the Levite of the sons of Asaph. And he said, Listen, all Judah. So Jehoshaphat the king prays, and he asks God for an answer. This one, Jehaziel, says, Listen up, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle's not yours, but God's. He says, tomorrow, head on down towards where they're going to want to fight you, but you don't need to fight at all. I'm going to take care of it. And here's how God spoke through prophets sometimes. This is the message. They came and they asked God, as it had been said that they should. God answered, and by what God said, they had confidence. Jehoshaphat, in verse 18, says, He bowed his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites, from the sons of the Kohathites, and the sons of the Korahites, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. Now, there's a lot to learn from this lesson. But you have the problem brought to the Lord. The Lord answers. And on the basis of what God said, they had a praise service. They got excited. They began to thank God for the victory that was not yet theirs. It was going to happen the next day when they get, went to war. And the next day, they got everybody out. They put their singers and praise praise leaders in the front of the, of the army that was going out. And they all trooped out towards where the battle was, praising God for the victory he had promised them. To find out the rest of the story, you'll have to come back here and read it. But let me tell you, a prophet was given the word of God with a message for the people. And that's exactly what was done. Think about the ones you may know about. Elijah and Elisha demonstrated God's power. They were powerful in mighty deeds that God had them do. And Jeremiah's message when he was a, the speaker was very unpopular. People locked him up because they didn't like what he was saying. Isaiah's clear forecast of Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Isaiah 53 is a remarkably accurate depiction of what was going to happen to Jesus centuries before Jesus came. Or the foretelling of, uh, of the Messiah's coming, the end times in Daniel's prophecy, right down through John the baptizer in the, at the time when Jesus was born. These Old Testament type prophets were given to Israel to tell them God's message. And then sometimes it went to people outside Israel. Jonah <clears throat> went to the Ninevites, Assyrians, to tell them of God's judgment coming. So when God sent word, he did it through prophets and through revelations that he gave to certain ones. Well, in Hebrews chapter 1, it tells us that all these different prophets who came many different ways and in many different portions, each one having a part of the main message, it says, in these last days has changed the way that God has sent his message. When it says in these last days, it means that 
we're in an age that's in the recent times, he's saying, the times we're in, these last times, we're getting a different message from God. The earth's history can be divided into three sections if you if you take the Bible's, Bible's um, layout. You have pre-flood. You have from creation to the flood of Noah's day. From the flood to the time of Christ is the time of law, when people in the word were to operate under the instructions, the law that God gave through Moses. And now in the age we are, since Christ has come, we're in the age of grace. It's a whole other time. And it's an unprecedented time of, uh, of invitation to come to know the Lord. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, it tells that Jesus was foreknown Yet now he's appeared in these latter days, it says. And in Hebrews 9.26, it talks about Christ coming at the consummation of the ages. It means we're in the last of these big sections of what Earth's history has been. What comes up after this is the wrap-up, the final wrap of what's going to happen on Earth. We are heading towards where it will finally be called. The Earth's time is done. It will be destroyed and a new heavens and new earth will be will, will be made what we're talking about now though is the time slot that we're in in this time slot that we are in now god has spoken the clearest message of all he sent his only son his only begotten son his son is in charge it says in these last days he's spoken to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things he's the inheritor of everything Jesus is, in fact, God's clearest expression of himself, the perfect representative of how God is. And Jesus got the job done. It said, he's the heir of all things, through whom he made the world. Jesus created, Jesus came, Jesus did what God sent him to do. And uh, now he has sat down at the right hand of God's majesty on high. Listen to, to this. I'm going to concentrate for the, this time on on the part where it says, through whom he made the world. In uh, Revelation chapter 4, this is a praise that was given to God. Revelation chapter 4. Starting with verse 9, I'm going to read 9 through 11. And when the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever, the 24 elders shall fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. It was by God's will, he conceived of the world, then he initiated its coming to be so. This is always interesting to me, to look at and see how God thought it up, caused it to be, and here we are, and the word of God presents it so that we see it. Let's look at it a little bit. This says in Hebrews chapter 1, that it was through his son that he created the world, that he made it. That's chapter 1, verse 2 of Hebrews. We and trees and bugs and birds are all a result of the, his thinking and the initiation of his thoughts into reality. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when he spoke it, he caused matter to form. We believe that the earth was made out of things that couldn't be seen, things that did not exist before he spoke it into existence. Hebrews 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. When he spoke it, he caused it to become. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. It says, even God who calls into being that which does not exist. It's an incredible thing to just sit back and conceive of this, that where there was nothing, when God spoke it, it became matter. It became 
matter and in energy and all that it is. Isaiah 48, verse 12 and 13 says, Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I called. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. Surely my hand founded the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. And in Exodus 20, verse 11, For in six days the Lord, and this says specifically Yahweh, made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. These talk about the greatness of God's creation. And the creation of the world indicates that God owns everything. If I make something by hand, if I paint a picture, if I write a poem, or if I, if I build something, it's mine. I can give it away, I can sell it, I can burn it, I can do whatever I want to with it. It is mine. Because of my creativity, I caused it to be. God made the world and all that's in it. He has the right to tell us what is right and wrong, how we should live, what we're created for. He's the one who had his purpose in mind when he made us. So we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then God's word starts zeroing in on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we start coming to find out that it's Christ himself who is involved in the making. If you look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus Christ was essential in the creating, and he was involved in and in control of, and was the one calling forth light and land and life to be so. I'm going to give you just a few more scriptures. In Hebrews 1 and verse 2, it talks about through whom God made the world. It was through Christ Jesus that he made the world. In Colossians, Chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, it says this. Colossians 1, 15 to 17, puts it this way. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. When it says it's in his image, it means what you see in Christ reflects his Father. It's, he shows you what the Father's like when you look at him. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And we're going to come back to that later. But it, we're told that the that things continue. They're upheld by the word of his power. And it's he who made it and he who keeps it going. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it says this. For in him all the fullness of deity, of godness, dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. This is Jesus who's in charge. And, we, and then in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, um, and, and verse 6, it tells us Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. This creator, this one who would, had the power to call into being what had not formerly existed, is the one who, in Philippians 2, 6, and 7, says, although he existed in the form of God, in that form, he called forth what didn't exist into the world and the creation that we know. Although he existed in the form of God, and the Amplified says he possessed the fullness of the attributes which make God, God. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be forcefully held on to, but emptied himself and took on the form of humanity, of, of mankind. He became flesh and blood. And John 1.14 tells us, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld its glory, Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. The Word who was God 
became flesh. And in this, it's telling us he didn't just inhabit a body. It wasn't like he was separate from and inhabited this body and animated it and made it go. He became joined to his humanity, joined body, soul, and spirit. So he was fully human as well as fully God. He took on man form, and he didn't just inhabit it, he became it. He is the only pre-existing being to become human. I know that people have a lot of philosophies and a lot of things about, about that souls are in heaven and God puts them in a body. That's not true. Here's what it says in Psalm 139, verse 16. David is talking to the Lord. He says, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. For us, there was a time before us, and there will be a time after us, with our section of this time on earth. With the Lord Jesus, it's not so. He became flesh, but he didn't quit being. He pre-existed before he ever became flesh. And when he came into human existence, he became the true son of man. You'll read about the son of man in the book of Daniel. And then when he's talking in the New Testament, he often refers to himself that he is the son of man, the son of man. And it's his reference. In John 17 and verse 5, it tells us he's talking to the father and said, Father, I want them to see my glory that I had before I came here. So he took and inserted himself into his own creation. This one, this one who had created life, inserted himself into life. Matthew chapter 1 tells the lineage of the Messiah, Jesus. He had to enter as a Jewish descendant of Abraham. For for him to be Messiah, he had to be Jewish. So he had to be one of Abraham's children. Secondly, he had to be in David's family line. Third, he had to retain his identity as God, all while being truly human. In some ways, it makes me, I I picture him jumping into a moving train. Time is going on, and he had to hit the exact spot at the exact time that he was supposed to, and he popped in exactly where he should have been as with a Jewish heritage, a heritage of his family, being in David's line, being in the perfect time. We're told in the word that in the fullness of time, God set forth his son, born of a woman. And it makes it clear that this is very specifically what God picked out for a time and place that he was born. One day it'll be interesting to note and see what it is that was so important of that specific time. But We can get some hints, and we'll probably talk about that over the next little while. But he had to retain his identity of being God. In uh, Matthew 1, verse 23, it, it uses a prophecy, and it says, And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So we read in the beginning of the word, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then we read about Jesus being the creator. And then we see that from prophecy, that God willed himself into our realm as God. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then it goes on to say, of his kingdom, there'll be no end, and of peace. Because when he comes to be that savior, which he did, he came to establish the kingdom that gives peace. There'll be no end to the increase of his kingdom, of his government, or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness, From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The enthusiastic involvement of God is what he meant and he intended for this child 
Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Think about those titles. This was a little tiny baby boy born in Bethlehem, Judea, that one evening. When you wrap up a new little baby, the experiences us having our babies, the, you wrap up this new little baby. Our, our firstborn was so tiny, it felt like when you wrapped the blanket up, it just felt like a folded blanket, like there couldn't be really anything in there. Tiny, tiny human. And you start looking and examining, you see all the little fingernails and and, and fingers and toes and, and that they got all the parts and you're, you're so excited about seeing this new little creature that at first can't do anything except eat and sleep and make diapers that need changing. And and you work with them and you, you start getting them. About two months into it, they get so they can start reacting to you and they start smiling when you do dumb stuff. And so for the next 15 years, you do dumb stuff to try and make them smile. You just love the the look and the smile of those new babies. And and as we would watch each of our children come to the place where they could start responding and stuff, what delight to the heart. Jesus started out that way. But it wasn't his start at existing. It was his start at his humanity. He existed before and inhabited the weakest and most vulnerable of positions, a new baby. And so at Christmas time, what we celebrate is the coming of the gift of God that Hebrews 1 tells us was God clearly speaking to us a message he wanted us to know. God, after he'd spoken long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions of scripture, in many ways, lots of variety in the, the different people he chose and the way they gave the message. In these last days, these days that we're in now, has spoken to us in his son. What Jesus is, what that little new baby boy was, was God expressing himself to us in the clearest possible way. More clear even than the messages that were given to prophets. More clear than any other revelation he had done of himself of his love for us, of how far he would go to redeem those he's calling to himself. That's the good news of Christmas. It isn't just a celebration of a birthday. It's a celebration of all the blessing of God poured out through his son. Well, that's our introduction. Tell me the story of Jesus. We want to continue on digging in and, and seeing about Christ, who he truly is, realizing good things do come in small packages because that new little boy was the savior that would save the world. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you have given and you've given so much. And what you've given it in is in Christ Jesus. You've given him to us. You sent him to be the one who would, in fact, accomplish salvation. You're not just a God who sits back and a God who has a lot of potential. You're a God who does things. That's some of what we're going to be looking at over the next couple of sessions. Help, O oh Lord, for us to have an understanding of your work, how you do it, why you do it, and what you've shown us about yourself in Christ Jesus. Thank you. May we be part of those who praise and glorify God for all you've done. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Get excited. It's okay. You can celebrate the coming of Christ. It's good news all the way around. And whether someone appreciates it or they don't believe it, or if someone else argues that it wasn't as big a deal as it was, God says it was a big deal. And he did this specifically and caused to be the salvation with which we can have eternal life. We'll be hitting on this some more next time, and we'll see you next time. God bless you. Keep going after God with all you got. Bye.